My name's Liam Blackmore. I am the decarbonisation coordinator and I sit within the technical policy group. Over the last five years, I've been developing the policy and regulations and procedures for decarbonisation, including ammonia, hydrogen, methanol, and other supporting technologies such as fuel cells. Ammonia is one of the most traded commodities globally at this time. It has the molecular structure of NH3, so it has no carbon, so we can reduce our CO2 emissions by implementing and utilizing this fuel within our industry. Ammonia is flammable, can be explosive, but it has a low reactivity. It is highly toxic and can present material compatibility issues. We have addressed these within our rules and regulations for the consumption of ammonia as fuel. One of the important requirements that I'd like to highlight to you today is the additional requirement beyond natural gas is assigning a toxic area zoning on board the ship. This goes beyond hazardous area zoning. The bow tie diagram enables us to think about an event hazard. Typically, for the low flashpoint and gaseous fuels, we think about the greatest event hazard being a release of fuel to the atmosphere. This would be the event hazard. This is the central circle of the diagram. On the left-hand side, we have the initiating hazardous events. Those are the events that can happen. If the safeguards do not prevent the event hazard from occurring, we escalate towards the consequences. This enables us to clearly communicate ideas with regards to risks of the system. The safety implications of a toxic fuel being consumed on board the ship is exposure to humans and the aquatic environment to that substance itself, so toxic exposure. It's the time domain that we have to consider. So not only the absolute limit, but also the duration of that exposure. So what we'd say is the dosage or the load. So we have the concentration over the time. Our safeguards and mitigation are reducing the absolute concentration and reducing the time. The UK government, the US government, the Environmental Protection Agency, and other agencies and organizations around the world have set limits to safe practices for those that are exposed to ammonia gas. These set a limit on the dosage and time. What's critical for us to understand in the marine industry is the absolute exposure of the parts per million that that human, the worker, the crew on board will be exposed to, but also the duration. Those two parameters will have an effect on the consequences. No, it's not possible to eliminate the hazards associated to ammonia's fuel. They're inherent to the characteristics and behavior. What we can do is apply philosophies such as inherently safer design, hierarchy of engineering controls, best practice, engineering judgment, and as we do in our own rules and regulation, standardization. Inherently safer design focuses on elimination of the hazards or a reduction in the magnitude rather than controlling the consequences. Inherently safer design has the greatest impact during the initial stages. Engineers and naval architects have the greatest ability to implement inherently safer design during the design stage rather than at new construction, commissioning or in service. Hence, early on in our projects, we need to ensure that we focus on trying to eliminate the hazards or reducing the magnitude. The hierarchy of engineering controls speaks to inherently safer design in the fact that we think about elimination, substitution, engineering controls, administrative controls, and PPE. The rules, regulations, and international policy for ammonia as fuel need to be developed. Risks for ammonia need to be managed not only by Lloyd's Register, but by the IMO, ship owners, and by society at large. 
This is going to be a pathway to maturity for everybody. At this present time, Lloyd's Register has rules and regulations for the consumption of ammonia as fuel. It is anticipated that the IMO will have their interim guidelines for the consumption of ammonia as fuel other than gas carriers developed at CCC 10 in 2024. And at present, IAC's Safety Carbonisation Panel has a working group developing unified requirements, interpretations and recommendations. This is important. We do not want arbitration within the industry where the minimum level of safety is different within global regions, amongst class societies and amongst flag administrations. At this present time, there is no marine type approved ammonia fueled engine available in the market. Lloyd's Register is actively working with the large engine manufacturers to realize this ambition, such as MAN, WinGD, Vodzilla. They have completed simulations. They have had single cylinder tests completed. And at this present time, they're developing their test facilities to run full scale validation testing of the engines. Until we have the full scale data from these tests, we will not understand the environmental impact, namely N2O and ammonia itself through slippage. When we think about the most significant hazard with ammonia, toxicity, and we think about the maintenance, operation, and inspection of that engine through life, not only do we need to understand the emissions from the engine, but also how are we gonna safely enter that engine, inspect it, maintain it, and for us as Lloyd's Register, survey it. The most important thing to note when surveying and inspecting machinery, equipment and components containing ammonia as fuel is your own individual safety and that of the crew on board. The development of survey procedures for ammonia fueled ships is formed during the RBC 5 stage. This shall be cognizant of the surveys being undertaken. During these surveys, the additional degradation, deteriorations that we have within the system will be corrosion, potentially stress corrosion cracking, the detection and alarm systems, increased rates of ventilation, the allocation of equipment, and to ensure that change management has been completed in a transparent and approved manner. It's important to note for ammonia fueled vessels that we can draw on the existing experience that we have within the LR technical teams with surveying ammonia carriers. This will be important when we come to standardizing and developing our survey policy, our construction procedures, etc. During a survey, I would expect at this time, the surveyor to have a greater emphasis and concentration on corrosion, on the safety systems apply, such as gas detection systems that are critical to mitigating the toxic load, to the ventilation, as we will be requiring increased rates of ventilation, or that the dilution of that ventilation is critical to achieve the necessary level of safety. Equally, the designation of toxic zoning to ensure that compliance to that has been maintained, and to the other management of change and the escalation of those changes and impacts to safeguards that we might have already applied on board. Ultimately, the surveyor will continue to confirm that compliance is met to our rules, regulations and procedures, that deterioration and degradation of the systems has maintained that minimum level of safety as we would expect. As you correctly identified, ammonia is flammable, can be explosive, and is toxic. At this present time, the IMO, the International Maritime Organization, is developing the interim guidelines for the safe consumption of ammonia on board IGF compliant vessels. We expect the document to be published in 2024.